This is an anatomy tutorial on axial T2 MR images. At this level, we see the slightly flattened ovoid contour of the upper cervical spinal cord. At this level, we see the vertebral arteries about to pierce the dura to enter the subarachnoid space at the foramen magnum. CSF in the subarachnoid space surrounds the upper cervical spinal cord, which remains slightly ovoid at this location. The anterior median sulcus, the anterior median sulcus between the pyramids is visible at this level. At the next level up, the cerebellar tonsils are visible at the level of the hypoglossal canals that conduct the 12th cranial nerve or hypoglossal nerve to innervate the tongue. Moving up another level, we still see cerebellar tonsils. As we continue further cephalad, the medulla takes on a more quadrilateral configuration due to prominence of the inferior olivary eminence. The restiform body adds bulk to the posterior medulla at this level. Outlets of fourth ventricle are the bilateral foramina of Lushka, think L for lateral, and the midline foramen of Magendi, think M for midline. By this level, the vertebral arteries have converged and formed the basilar trunk. There is some elongation at the posterior lateral medulla, indicating the level of the inferior cerebellar peduncles, also known as the restiform bodies. Pointed out here. Here is the vermis of the cerebellum in the posterior midline and it is flanked by the slightly darker dentate nuclei. Notice that the cerebellar vermis forms the roof of the fourth ventricle. At this level we can see the seventh which is the facial nerve and the eighth which is the vestibulocochlear nerve traversing the internal auditory canals to move peripherally into the temporal bone where the seventh nerve courses for motor function of the face and where the eighth nerve reaches cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canals to mediate hearing and balance. These are the cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canals on each side. By this level, the inferior portion of the temporal lobes are coming into view. The middle cerebellar peduncles are bulky fiber tracts that contribute to the prominent belly of the pons. Slight difference in signal intensity reflects the tegmentum of pons. At this same level, slight bumps here, at the floor of the fourth ventricle, represent the facial colliculi. The trigeminal nerve on the right side can be seen exiting from the anterolateral upper pons. Slight imperfections in patient positioning have made the left side trigeminal nerve not lie in the same plane. These fluid-filled spaces along the posterior and lateral aspect of cavernous sinuses are the Meckel's caves, through which the trigeminal nerve passes. More medially and within the cavernous sinus, we can see the internal carotid arteries. For orientation purposes, all the structures we described on this level are in the same axial plane as the eyes and the upper nose.
Moving further cephalad, we can see the rostral portion of the fourth ventricle. Its lateral margins are the superior cerebellar peduncles. Here is the posterior lobe of the cerebellar hemisphere and the anterior lobe. The primary fissure of cerebellum that separates anterior and posterior lobes was better demonstrated on the sagittal. This is the tegmentum of pons, and it is separated by the medial lemniscus of pons from the basilar pons, shown here in the more ventral portion. The basilar artery and the bilateral internal carotid artery supply the brain with oxygen and nutrients, and the brain receives about 25% of cardiac output, more than any other tissue by weight. Here at the uppermost level of the pons, we see fourth ventricle tapering superiorly. These are the temporal horns of lateral ventricles. Note the change in surface texture between the broad cerebral gyri that lie above and lateral to the dashed line of the tentorium and the thinner, more parallel arrangement of folia of the cerebellum posterior and medial to the dashed line of the tentorium. The infundibulum is visible outlined by white or hyperintense CSF in the supracellar cistern. These dotted lines indicate the optic nerves within the CSF-containing optic sheaths. These structures, marked in yellow, are the anterior clinoid processes of the skull and the optic sheath complex and optic nerve course medial to the anterior clinoid processes. The internal carotid arteries also course medial to the anterior clinoid processes. Moving higher, we see the infundibulum coursing through the supracellar cistern between the hypothalamus above and the pituitary gland in the cella below. The interpeduncular cistern that we can see also on sagittal and coronal images is a good landmark for the oculomotor or third nerve exit site. Here is the rostral portion of fourth ventricle tapering to the cerebral aqueduct, which is the narrowest part of the ventricular system. These are the ambient cisterns along the lateral aspect of the midbrain. On either side of the supracellar cistern lies the uncus, and posterior to the uncus on each side is the hippocampal formation that we can see better on parasagittal images through the temporal lobe. This curved dashed line demarcates the margin where the tentorium separates the cerebellum below from the cerebral hemispheres above. The tentorium tapers superiorly like a cone and we can see that feature of its shape better on the coronal. Once again, we see the anterior clinoid processes which influence the course of the internal carotid arteries as they are leaving the cavernous sinus and coursing on the medial aspect of each anterior clinoid process. Anterior clinoid processes also form the lateral walls of the optic foramina that conduct the optic nerves shown here with the dashed red lines. Here is the gyrus rectus, beneath which lies the olfactory bulb and tract mediating smell as cranial nerve 1, just above the superior nasal cavity.
and we could see this relationship better on the coronal. At this level, we have the quadrigeminal plate cistern at the level of the inferior colliculus. In the midline here, we have the cerebral aqueduct, and surrounding that is the periaqueductal gray. These structures lie at the approximate level of the decusation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. Here is one of the paired mammillary bodies that reside in the roof of the interpeduncular cistern. These can usually be easily identified on a sagittal image. This is the cerebral peduncle, sometimes known as the cruce cerebri, or foot of the cerebrum. This bit of CSF in the midline is within the third ventricle, separated from the cistern by the hypothalamic walls. Components of the anterior visual pathway cross in the anterior midline at the inferior aspect of the hypothalamus. This is called the optic chiasm, where the fibers cross. At this level, we can see middle cerebral arteries coursing in the lateral sulci that separate the frontal and temporal lobes. Remember that the middle cerebral artery is one of the terminal branches of the internal carotid artery, and the other terminal branch is the anterior cerebral artery. This image is at the level of quadrigeminal plate cistern at the superior colliculus level. This CSF is in the quadrigeminal plate cistern. At this level, we can see the paired dark structures which represent the red nuclei. And the adjacent dark structures, more anteriorly and laterally, are the substantia nigra. These dots of white matter, and remember, on T2, white matter is darker than gray matter, are the columns of the fornix that we can also trace out in the sagittal, and they lie on either side of the anterior third ventricle. The anterior commissure has this characteristic curve, something like bicycle handlebars on both axial and coronal images, and connects corresponding portions of the right and left temporal lobes, running in the anterior wall of third ventricle, also known as the lamina terminalis. So, the CSF that is posterior to the anterior commissure is within the third ventricle, and the CSF anterior to the anterior commissure is in the longitudinal sulcus. These arrows point out the bilateral anterior cerebral arteries, which course in the longitudinal sulcus anterior to the anterior commissure. At the next level up, we are able to see CSF in the atria of the lateral ventricles. The atria are bounded medially by the isthmus of the cingulate gyrus that turns into the parahippocampal gyrus just beneath the splenium of the corpus callosum. The pineal lies in the midline above the quadrigeminal plate. The posterior commissure is located here, immediately anterior to the pineal. These dark structures are deep cerebral venous structures that have their confluence in the posterior midline behind and inferior to the splenium of the corpus callosum. Once again, the anterior commissure is visible here, demarcating anterior extent of third ventricle.
these dashed red lines demarcate middle cerebral artery branches that course through the lateral sulci. Remember, lateral sulci separates the frontal and temporal lobes. The arterial branches are the small black dots. And these arrows point out the pulvinar of thalamus. The columns of fornix come closer to midline as we get above the anterior third ventricle, and those columns of fornix form the posterior margin of the septum pellucidum. The heads of caudate nuclei indent the frontal horns of lateral ventricles. Globus pallidus, pointed out here, accumulates minerals that make it darker on T2-weighted images. The globus pallidus lies posterior and medial to the putamen, pointed out here. The anterior limb of internal capsule courses between the caudate nucleus and the globus pallidus and putamen. Together, the globus pallidus and putamen are sometimes referred to as the lenticular nuclei. The posterior limb of internal capsule courses between the lenticular nuclei and the thalamus. The thalamus is roughly egg-shaped and presents a convex margin toward the third ventricle. This image shows the splenium of corpus callosum, an important landmark that we can see even better on sagittal images. Occipital horn of the left lateral ventricle is seen here, extending posteriorly from the atrium of the lateral ventricle. Contained within the lateral ventricle is choroid plexus that produces cerebrospinal fluid. As we progress cephalad, this is the final section that contains lateral sulcus. Some choroid plexus is visible coursing over the top of the thalamus in the body of the lateral ventricles. Corona radiata projections from the internal capsule extend upward toward cortex as we make our way up through the lateral ventricles. On this image, we have marked the central sulcus, but it is not possible to reliably identify it as such on this image alone. Instead, we need to identify it on higher images and then follow it down. White matter above the ventricles is sometimes referred to as centrum semiovale, and this white matter conducts fibers toward cortex and makes connections between adjacent regions with association fibers. The central sulci are marked, but this has to be done by tracing it down from above. Alternatively, if using a whole brain specimen, that technique also works to identify the central sulcus. Again, the central sulcus. At this level, we can see the superior frontal gyri and portions of the middle frontal gyri, as well as the central sulci. At this level, superior and middle frontal gyri and the posterior portion of middle frontal gyri are visible. Posterior parts of the middle frontal gyri are the frontal eye fields. Posterior to that, we find the precentral sulcus, then the precentral gyrus or motor strip, then the central sulcus, marked here in red, and behind that, the postcentral gyrus, which is parietal lobe. The central sulcus becomes distinct and reliably identifiable near the top of the brain because it is the sulcus that extends highest and most medial and has the paracentral lobule 
at its superior and medial extent. So as we get higher and higher, our level of confidence in identifying the central sulcus increases. And here is our final image. So everything anterior to the central sulcus is frontal lobe in this image, and everything posterior to central sulcus in this image is parietal lobe.